In this last lecture, we are going to talk about ecology, which is going to be studying the interactions between organisms and their environment. So the definition of ecology is a scientific study of the interactions between organisms and their environment. And so we can look at organisms that live in lots of different types of environments. We can look at the plants, we can look at the microbiota, we can look at all these different organisms and see how are they going to interact with their environment. It's going to be important to start to be able to categorize these interactions in different ways. And we can talk about the living part of the environment and the part that is non-living. Okay. And so when we talk about like things like water, water is not living, but it's going to be essential for living organisms. So the way that we're going to talk about this is in a hierarchy of interactions. So ecology is one of the most broad areas of, of biology because it's going to not only look at the organisms, but in their environment. And then ultimately you can study ecology at the, the biosphere level, which is the entire world. So when we look at an organism and their interactions with the environment, we're going to classify kind of these different factors into two different categories. The first category is going to be biotic factors. And so think about this word bio, bio means life. So these are going to be the living components of the environment. So all of the organisms, all of the plants, all of the funguses, all of the microorganisms, all of those are going to be biotic. We also will then have another set of factors which are called abiotic. Okay, and a before biotic means these are non-living. Okay, and these are gonna be things like all the chemicals in the environment. Water, where is the carbon? Where is the nitrogen? Where is the phosphorus? All of these things are gonna be really important. Light, um, temperature, all of these are going to influence how an organism is going to live its life. And so it's important to look at these different aspects. So again, you have to be able to look at both the biotic, the living and the non-living aspects of the environment. When we talk about organisms, we're going to say that they live in a habitat and that's going to be a specific type of environment that's going to include a variety of these different types of biotic and abiotic factors. So if we're talking about specific species like an elephant, we're going to need to know what type of trees are there for them to feed on, what other types of um, animals are around. Okay. We also can then look at what are going to be the, uh, the water and the temperature levels and all of those things that are going to be important for the elephants. So you have to take in those to account and that's going to be what the habitat is. So now we're going to talk about the levels that we can look at ecology through. Um, and I just wanted to you examine this, this figure over here and realize that at this point, we've basically gone through all of these different steps from the atoms to the molecular level to the cellular level. We don't really talk about tissues very much or organs or body systems in this class, but we definitely talked about the organismal level and even the population. Okay, because when we talked about evolution, we know that the population is going to be kind of what we look at for evolution. So we're going to kind of break different types of ecology down and each level is going to be slightly more comprehensive, which means it's going to include all of the interactions that were in the previous um, kind of step. So our first step is going to be this, what we call organismal ecology. Okay. And so this is going to be looking at an organism, um, and kind of all the evolutionary adaptations that have enabled this organism to live in certain environments. Okay. And so we're going to look at the environment and say, well, what are the different challenges that this environment is going to impose on this organism and how has the organism adapted to that environment? Okay. And so you're kind of seeing this interface between the organism and their environment. So when we've talked about things like, um, in the past, uh, Cactus, cactus are going to be adapted to live in a very dry environment. The abiotic challenges for a cactus is that there's very little water, there's high heat, okay, and so those have then shaped what the cactus looks like today, okay, and has allowed um, the cactus to persist because it has these different adaptations. 
Now, if we go a step up from that, this is going to be called population ecology. So we're now looking at the population or a group of organisms that are living in the same area. Now, when we talk about these, we're saying that they're all the same species. So we're going to talk about all the elephants in this population. Okay, so it's going to be all in a specific geographic area. We're going to look mainly at how this population is going to change over time, how it's going to kind of increase in the number of um, organisms or decrease, what's the birth rate, what's the death rate, how long do they live, things like that. Okay, so that's going to be our next level, but that encompasses the organismal level. Moving on from there, we now have the next level up, which is called community ecology. And so this is not just looking at one population of organisms, but all populations of organisms in one area. So we know that if we look at where the elephants live, it's not going to just be elephants. We often are going to see antelope and there can be, you know, tig or not tigers, but um, uh, lions and things like that, giraffes. All of those can live in the same area and so we would call that a community so a community would be all the other organisms that inhabit that same area now when we study this type of ecology this is looking at the interactions between the different organisms so we'll talk about different type different ways that organisms can interact with each other they can be positive they can be negative they can be neutral um, and we'll kind of give some names to those different types of interactions now, the highest level that we're going to talk about today is going to be the ecosystem level. And so the ecosystem level is going to be concerned with all of the abiotic factors and the community of the species in a certain area. This is going to have a special emphasis on how energy and chemicals are going to cycle through the system. And so it's going to be important to kind of understand you know, what different organisms we have in place, um, where is the water, where are the nutrients, how are they being recycled, so what are our decomposers, um, all of that's going to come into play. And so we're kind of not only looking at interactions between organisms, but now interactions with them and their environment. The biosphere, which we will not really talk about today, is going to be the global, global ecosystem, and this would be the sum of every single ecosystem on the planet. When we talk about certain ecosystems, we tend to think of like the desert or the savanna or um, the alpine or the tundra. So those are going to be specific types of ecosystems. And then when we look at the biosphere, it's going to be all of those together. So we're now going to examine organismal um, ecology. And so we're going to first talk about adaptations to the environment. So we're going to discuss and of how different organisms are going to adapt and respond to different environmental pressures. The reason why I chose this picture as the background of the slide is because one way to deal with an environmental pressure, for example, if it gets really cold during the winter, is for birds to migrate. And they will migrate to a different location so that they can then have more food um, and they will then return once the, the weather is better. Okay, and so birds are a really good example of this where they have found a way to kind of deal with kind of harsh winter conditions. When we look at organisms and where they live, you can see this extreme adaptation to the environment. And so organisms are going to be in areas that they are adapted to live because over long periods of time, and through the process of natural selection, they have developed mechanisms to live in these different types of environments. And so there's this really close relationship between ecology and evolutionary biology. Now, natural selection is always going to kind of result in from the interactions between the organisms in their environment. And so different traits that are going to allow for an organism to survive and reproduce are going to be what is selected for. So there are going to be different types of events that can occur short term during a, the individual's lifetime, but those then can translate into effects over a long scale of evolutionary time. So if we have a population of cactus and we go far enough back and we have some cactus that start to develop these spines on them. So you have kind of 
a phenotype. One phenotype is a smooth cactus. The other phenotype is going to be one with kind of these little um, pokey spines on it. You can then see that, well, what happens if there is a animal that likes to eat the flesh of the cactus? And the animal is going to prefer to eat the smooth cactus over the spiny cactus because it's not going to taste very good or have, you know, be very good for the animal to have all these spines on its tongue. And so if all of those nice smooth cactus are, are eaten during a season, they're not going to leave any offspring for the next generation. And so only those that have these spines potentially are going to survive and reproduce. And so over time, you can see how there could be selection for even bigger spines and other types of adaptations that are going to make it so these cactus are going to be able to survive and thrive in this environment. So if we also look at things like after a period of low rainfall, you can then see the plants that are able to deal with kind of this drought, those ones are going to survive and do better than other plants. And so you're going to see this again all the time in these different organisms. The ones that are able to survive because they have some slightly different trait are going to be the ones that are going to be able to reproduce. And we can start to see those kind of increase in um, the population. And that is what evolution is. As we all know, the abiotic factors of a habitat can change from year to year. And you may say, do I know that? Well, if you know that there is a winter and a summer in different temperatures and different moisture amounts, then yes, you do know. So we know that over a year, we'll have different seasons. And those different seasons are going to have different abiotic factors that are going to be important. Now, organisms are going to evolve this ability to deal with that variability so that you don't have a situation where an organism is going to be completely maladapted to an environment just because it had a, a seasonal difference happen. So an individual's ability to adjust to those environmental changes during its lifetime, so this is not talking about from generation to generation, but within a lifetime, that itself is going to be an adaptation that natural selection can act on. And so you're going to start to see some um, different examples that you may not have thought about in necessarily this light, but it is actually going to be an organism adjusting to its environmental um, variability. So for example, we will have different types of organisms that will migrate. So it's not just birds, but birds are a really good example. They will migrate from kind of cold regions to warmer regions so that they can have plenty of food. It's this kind of thing where why would they stay in a cold region when they have this ability to fly and go somewhere where it has a better temperature and there's more food? We consider that a behavioral response because they're behaving in a different way. They are going to fly from one location to another. Another type of way to deal with this is that you can have an anatomical response. And so an anatomical response means that you are somehow changing your anatomy. So for example, some birds are going to be able to have heavier feathers during the winter and lighter feathers during the summer. And they can change this depending on temperature. They also can have physiological responses, which you're not necessarily changing your anatomy, but you are going to somehow use your body and kind of the physiological responses to deal with some type of change. So for example, a bird may not change the type of feathers it has, but it can actually fluff up and hold more heat within its feathers. And so that will be a physiological response. So these responses will occur during the lifetime of an individual, and they do not necessarily quant um, qualify as evolution. But if we see that individuals that are able to do a behavioral response or anatomical response or physiological response, if those ones survive and have more babies, you can then start to see this change over time. Okay, so again, population is what we look at for evolution. So you'd have to start seeing that this ability is going to increase in the population, and then we have evolution.
So there are different types of physiological responses, and one type is called acclimation. And this is going to be a gradual and reversible physiological adjustment. So if you've heard anything about climbing Mount Everest, you um, probably know that it requires you to go to base camp, which is really high up um, in the mountains, but it's not anywhere near as high as the peak of Mount Everest. And so what happens is you have to get used to the altitude um, in order for you to be able to climb Mount Everest. Okay, the altitude is really high and it is going to have a lot less oxygen. So your body is going to need to change to that environment. Now there are different types of things that are going to happen. One of them is that you're going to increase the number of red blood cells that you have in your body. Red blood cells are going to be what carry oxygen and deliver it to your different cells. And so an individual that's at really high altitude is going to need more red blood cells than someone that is at a lower altitude because of the amount of oxygen. So if you go high enough, there is not as much oxygen up there as there is at sea level, for example. And so the body will change and will adjust. Now this will go back to normal. So if you have people that climb Mount Everest, if they then finish, go back to where they live, their body is eventually going to adjust the number of red blood cells back to kind of the, the amount that they need. So it's reversible. So it's going to be able to go backwards. Okay, and uh, this ability is going to usually be related to the range of environmental conditions a species will naturally experience. So Mount Everest is kind of an extreme example. There's not really a reason why people should ever climb Mount Everest. Um, it's not something that is necessary for them to survive and live. Um, if anything, it's very dangerous and it's really expensive. So Mount Everest example kind of is not good for this, but there are people that live at really high altitudes just naturally. So if you go to the Andes in South America, the Andes are really tall and there are people that live at those really high altitudes and they're going to need to be able to deal with this environmental change. When we look at the groups of organisms that are going to be able to tolerate these very kind of, kind of, greatest temperature extremes, they're most likely going to be endotherms. Um, this mainly has to do with cold temperatures because humans and other endotherms are going to be able to maintain a kind of a standard body temperature um, in order to kind of keep everything going. And ectotherms, you're not going to find them in very cold places because if they get too cold, they're basically going to die. So if you've ever been into Canada and even higher north than that, you're going to start to notice that you don't see things like lizards. Okay, lizards live in California. We have a ton of them because they're able to deal with these um, temperature changes, but other organisms are not. But humans and other endotherms are going to be able to live in various locations because we have this ability to kind of um, regulate our body temperature. Okay, so again, ectotherms, which are reptiles, they're not going to be able to tolerate kind of this wide variety of changes. Now, the one thing to remember is that birds are considered reptiles. However, they are endotherms. So birds will be kind of in this group of the endotherms. They do not belong in the ectotherm group. So if you look at kind of where the lizards live um, in the United States, you're going to see that we live in a hotbed of lizards. Um, we, I think, I can't really tell exactly where we are on that map, but I'm assuming that we are either in, we're definitely in the orange and probably in the yellow. But if you go up into areas like the Midwest, um, those are going to have very few species, okay, and not very many are going to be able to live there. That's most likely because of those regions having a more harsh winter. Um, we do not have a really harsh winter. We basically, you know, it's rare for us to get below freezing um, for more than maybe a couple nights. Um, but other places are going to have sustained below freezing. And so ectotherms just can't live there. Now, here's an anatomical response that I think many of you will be familiar with. And this has to do with your fur, the fur of your pet. So if you have a dog, and I feel like it's a little more obvious with dogs, at least in my um, experience, but also with things like cats. 
but you'll know that their their coat is going to change depending on the season so dogs when they're going into winter tend to have this kind of thicker undercoat and that's going to help keep them warm and then in the summer they usually are going to shed all that and will have kind of just their their top coat so it's going to be able to change how they're dealing with different environmental temperatures okay so this is a really common thing that happens in mammals um, because we have fur and you can kind of have this reversible change so during different parts of the season you're going to have different types of fur there are other types of anatomical changes that are irreversible um, over the lifetime of an individual so it's like once it's happened once an organism has lived in this situation for a period of time it will no longer be able to go backwards um, and the example i have of this is actually a tree that has kind of faced a really strong wind that's going to kind of hit it on one side and basically has made it so all of the branches are going to be on just one side of the tree the tree can't have any branches on the other side because if it does they'll just break off and so this tree has been irreversibly changed and will never grow kind of um, branches on that side all right so this is called flagging and uh, those will kind of change you can see these on lots of different trees um, when I went to Cal State San Bernardino Cal State San Bernardino for some reason has really really high temp um, winds and all the trees are going to look like this so in this image we can see what the arctic fox looks like in the winter and the summer so in the winter it's going to have a different coat which includes a different coat color um, it's going to be white so that it blends in with the snow and then in the summer it's going to lose a majority of that fur and it's going to kind of be this darkish gray brownish color um, during the summer and that's going to help it blend in during those different times and so these are going to be reversible changes um, that this species has evolved now there are going to be a lot of behavioral responses and animals respond behaviorally um, in ways that plants can't because plants aren't able to kind of pick up and leave if they're in a place they don't want to be in uh, plants um, animals however can and so if an animal is in a location that is no longer going to be good for it it's going to actually um, be able to leave okay so ectotherms are going to be a good example of this in that they will kind of shuttle between the sun and the shade and so i think most people have experienced this where you see a lizard that's out on um, kind of a sunny area sometimes doing push-ups which are a type of di um, behavioral display and if you get too close they'll run back to the the shade but they are trying to warm themselves up and that's going to help them keep kind of a steady body temperature but this is a behavioral way to maintain that body temperature birds again will travel great distances so that they're not having to worry about changing the kind of feathers they have so instead of having uh, anatomical change they instead are going to just have a behavioral response in humans we have just a huge range of behavioral responses that we do when it's cold we put on a jacket we put on our heater uh, we can start our fire we do all those types of things drink warm drinks when it's cold we can um our i think i already say cold when it's hot we can put our air conditioner on we can um, go swimming we can do all these different types of things and all these are behavioral responses The humans have been able to spread into every region of the globe because of our behavioral responses okay so we can live in the most extreme high temperatures we can also go live in extreme low temperatures and so we have basically colonized every single available part of the globe we also have been able to go down into the depths of the ocean and we don't live there but we've been able to expand our range into that area and also into space and so humans are going to have this ability to have these behavioral responses which is ultimately why we are um, kind of the dominant group of organisms on the planet we're now going to move on to population ecology and so if you remember population ecology is now we're going to look at a whole population of organisms so we're not necessarily going to be looking at how the organism is 
dealing with these different environmental conditions, but more what's happening at the population level of this of this group. So are they having kind of an increase in population, a decrease in population? What are the things that affect their population? Um, that's all going to be in this category of population ecology. So a population is going to be a group of individuals that are all from the same species, okay? And they have to occupy the same general area. So you can have different species or the same species that live in different um, places. We wouldn't necessarily call them a population. They would be the same species, but they're not living in the same location. So a population has to be in the same general area at the same time, okay? And when we start looking at a population, we start to need to think about different um, aspects of how they're gonna interact with their environment. So they're gonna rely on the same resources, which is going to set up competition. They are going to be influenced by the same environmental factors, okay? And they're going to interact and breed with one another. And so this is what's going to happen within a population. When we look at population ecology, we're going to look at the changes in population size and the factors that regulate the population over time. Population ecology is an extremely important um, area of ecology. We look at this a lot with humans because human population is increasing at kind of a, a really quick rate. And one of the big issues is that we're going to start running out of food and space and resources like that. And so it's important to understand how populations are changing over time. So when you have a, a uh, population ecologist, they are going to then describe a population in a couple different ways. So they're going to want to know the number of individuals in a population. They're going to want to know what are kind of the, the age structure of that population. So how many young of that group, how many are old, how much are, how many are in the middle. Uh, and they're also going to want to know kind of the density. So the density has to do with kind of the number of individuals per volume or area. So we're going to think if we're looking at wolves, how many wolves are going to live in this, um, this area. Okay. And for wolves, for example, it's going to be a massive area. Wolves need a lot of space, but we have other types of organisms that don't take up, take up very much space at all. Um, and so we can look at how many are going to be in one area. Population ecologists will also study um, population dynamics. So this is going to be the interactions between the biotic, the living and the abiotic non-living factors that are going to cause variation in this population size. So what happens when there are too many individuals in the population that can actually cause a population to crash because they'll run out of food um, and things like that. There can also be kind of not enough space. Space is going to be abiotic. It's not going to be, you know, a living thing. Um, and that can affect the population size. Now, when we look at population, one of the big topics is population growth. Okay, so understanding what's causing the population to grow. At what point do we kind of reach something called a carrying capacity, which means that that area can no, cannot really grow um, much larger without having some, some problems. Now, when you're looking at population density, this is going to be kind of looking at the number of individuals per uh, unit area. And this could be a volume. So if we're talking about the ocean, we could say like, well, how much is in this, this area of water? Um, or we could say in this plot of land or in this national park, you know, where are going to be, what's the number of individuals in this population, okay? So there are different ways that you can measure the population density, and many of them are kind of impractical or impossible. It's extremely difficult to count all of the number of individuals in a population. Um, unfortunately, it just we don't have the manpower or the ability to kind of capture all of the different animals and count them. And also we don't really want to have to capture all the animals because that could be detrimental to the animal. And so it's important for us to be able to have these mechanisms to get an estimate of a population density um, that's accurate as possible, um, but knowing that it's not going to be precise. Okay, and so we'll talk about a couple of different sampling techniques um, to help establish or estimate these population densities. 
Okay. Um, it's really important to be able to get these numbers because then we can see how the population is changing. So if we are going to estimate the size of a population of birds, because we want to know, you know, are there enough places for them to have their nests? What happens if we build houses here or do this or, you know, put up one of these solar farms? We have to know how that's going to affect the, these birds. Okay. And so you have to then be able to say, well, what is our current population? What do we think is going to happen if we then build this? So estimating the age structure of population is also going to be something that ecologists want to do. They want to know kind of how many individuals in a population are going to be certain ages. Um, so you can kind of see what is the average age of the individuals. Um, so in this, for example, is going to be um, this bird species kind of looks like a finch to me. Um, it's the majority of the population is going to be about four years old um, and you're going to have some individuals that are 11, but not very many. And then you have some individuals that are kind of less than one years old, uh, but the majority are going to be about four years old. And so that might tell you something about how, um, how these different organisms survive and what's the age that most of them survive and tell and things like that. Now, you can then create something called a survivorship curve, which then shows how many individuals are still alive at each age. And there are going to be different types of survivorship curves. So there are going to be certain groups that are going to have, you know, they're going to have tons of babies and most of the babies are going to die. So for example, we're looking at an octopus right now. These are octopus eggs. There's so many of them. Most of them are going to die. Not very many are going to survive. But once they get past a certain age, then they tend to survive at a higher rate. Okay. And so there are going to be these different types of survivorship curves based on the different organisms. So if we have something called a type one curve, this is going to be a situation where the organism produces few offspring, but gives them very good care. And they have increasing likelihood that they will um, survive to maturity. Okay. So this is going to be something similar to a human. So we have fewer offspring, but we give them extremely good care, which then, you know, gives them a good likelihood of surviving to sexual maturity. Uh, type two curve are going to be this intermediate where they basically have an even survivorship at any point in their life. So they're not more likely to die as a young um, organism or an old organism. It's just kind of they have an even um, kind of survivorship. And a type three is going to be a curve that has very low survivorship for the very young. Okay. And then it's going to have a period when survivorship is very high for individuals who can then live to that certain age. And that's going to be an example for a lot of insects, um, fish, octopus, things like this. So here we have um, kind of three examples. We have humans on uh, the red line, which is going to be that type one survivorship curve. So we have a really good um, care of, our, of the offspring and we only have one or two at a time. Um, and you basically have a very good chance of surviving and then it's gonna taper off once you get really old. Um, in the middle, we have something like a squirrel that basically has kind of a, a even chance of survivability throughout its entire life. And then the last one is a barticle, and this is going to have kind of very low chance of survival as a young individual, but then as it gets older, it can actually live for a very long time. So it's like once you get past that, that critical period, um, they are then able to survive. Now, if we look at different organisms, they're going to have different types of life histories. And so the life history is kind of what what happens in the life of this organism? How many offspring do they have? Um, are they likely to survive as young or things like that? Okay, and so this is going to include things like the pattern of survivorship, um, also kind of schedule of reproduction and survival, and you know how many times do they reproduce in their life? All of these types of aspects, okay? So um, life history traits, we're going to talk about a couple of the different key life history um, factors. So the age at first reproduction is one of them. So when does an organism become reproductively active? 
the frequency of reproduction. So can they reproduce at any point once they're reproductively active or is it once a season, something like that. It could also be just once in a lifetime. So there are certain organisms that will have basically just one major reproductive event and then they die. So that's pretty common. Um, for example, salmon do that. Uh, they'll live for a while and then once they're a breeding age, they will then go uh, breed and then they die um, at the end of it. The number of offspring is going to be important. So how many offspring do you invest in? Do you invest in a lot of offspring but give them very little kind of resources? Or do you have very few offspring and put like a ton of energy and resources into that, that offspring? Okay, and then the amount of parental care that's given. So some organisms give absolutely zero parental care. They lay their eggs and they leave them. Um, others are going to have extensive parental care. Something like a human has, you know, basically, technically, you could say, um, until you're 18. But I think most of us um, that still are lucky enough to have our parents know that we still have parental care, even at ages much, much higher than 18. Okay, and you can see that each of these different traits are going to vary um, kind of depending on their survivorship curves. As we can see here, this bird uh, had a lot of babies and I think this is something like 50, around 50 different chicks. We, I think that when someone took this picture, they're pretty sure that some of those are from a different nest, um, but this mother is going to kind of care for them um, and make sure that, you know, as many of them survive as possible. All right, so when we look at different types of life histories, we can see that there are gonna be some individuals that we're going to call opportunistic life history. And they will take advantage of kind of um, immediate favorable conditions, okay? And these ones are usually going to have a type 3 survivorship curve. So when you think of wildflowers, we know that we've had some of these super blooms. Um, but what's happening is that when it's a good season and there's enough water and rainfall, the seeds that are laying dormant in the, the um, dirt will actually all come out and they will have this huge reproductive event, okay? So remember, flowers are there for reproduction. And they will then put all of their efforts into creating a bunch of eggs and seeds so that they can um, produce a large um, population, okay? Um, there are gonna be others that have something called the equilibrial life history. Um, these are gonna develop slowly. They reach sexual maturity later and they will produce kind of few well cared for offspring. Okay, and typically these equilibrial life history are gonna have larger bodied and longer lived um, uh, organisms. Okay, and those ones are gonna typically be like a type one survivorship curve. Okay, so you can see how the life history traits will then affect the type of survivorship that they would have. So here we have kind of different um, categories where we're looking at characteristics plus, you know, whether they're opportunistic populations or equilibrial populations. And we can see that um, when we look at the climate, opportunistic populations are gonna tend to live in areas that are relatively unpredictable. And so when it's a good time, they're gonna go for it. And when it's not, they won't try to reproduce. Uh, for large mammals, which are going to be the group that are equilibrial populations, they're going to have a relatively predictable um, climate because they're not going to be able to live in ex really extreme changes um, really quickly. Uh, it goes through all these different types of um, characteristics. You can see parental care for opportunistic populations, and these don't have to be flowers. They can be organisms as well, um, so animals there can be little to none, and you see that in most equilibrial populations, they're going to have often extensive parental care. So something like an elephant will have a very long interaction with its offspring and often will kind of maintain this bond throughout life, much like humans do. Um, the females often will live together in these multi-generational herds, 
um, and they will uh, kind of have something like a type one survivorship curve. Something like a frog, on the other hand, is going to be an opportunistic breeder. And so when the conditions are good and there's plenty of water, they will lay thousands of eggs. Um, not very many of them will survive, but they're kind of producing so many that the hope is that a couple of them will survive to the next generation. Fish can also be a really good example of this um, type three survivorship curve. They have lots and lots of eggs, uh, embryos, um, and you know, not very many of them are gonna survive to adulthood. Just think about what happens if finding Nemo, all the other eggs got eaten except for Nemo, and so he's the one that survives. Now, population growth models are going to be really important in human population, because you wanna understand how populations are changing uh, this is a uh, census year, and it's really important to know kind of how many people we have, where are they living, and things like that, because we need to be able to make sure that we are prepared for situations um, like the pandemic, which we were clearly not prepared for. But the idea is to have these population growth models to allow us to kind of prepare for different situations and make sure that we have, you know, enough medical supplies and enough um, hospital beds for our populations and other things, not just pandemic, but it got pandemic on the head, the brain. <laughs> so there are going to be uh, fluctuations uh, in populations. And so we're gonna have, you know, individuals that are gonna be born, they can move in and out of an area and they can die, okay? And so this is going to affect population growth. Uh, you can look at some populations, so this doesn't have to be humans, but if you look at a the, ma the mature forest, they're gonna have a relatively constant um, population over time. It's a very slow turnover. So these trees live for very, very long periods of time. The trees that kind of are growing beneath them often don't make it because there's not enough sunlight. And so you kind of have this stable um, population. Other populations can change rapidly. Um, some of them can be explosive in how quickly they can change. So for example, bacteria can produce kind of double the amount of um, the population numbers that they have in 20 minutes. Okay, so you can start off with 20 bacteria and in the next 20 minutes you can have then 40 bacteria. And that's, you know, this can basically have almost exponential growth. Okay, so population ecologists will use models to be able to investigate kind of how populations will change under time. So these are models that are based on mathematics. Uh, they take in different factors and try to kind of forecast different things that can happen. Okay, so they're never gonna be exactly correct and give you exact precise number like in the year 2021, we will have this many people, but it will be able to kind of tell you, well, how many people do we have of breeding age um, how many people have babies a year? If we have this many people, then we can predict that we have this, these many people having babies, this many people are gonna die, things like that. Okay, and so um, you can start to estimate these populations. Now, some populations will have what we call exponential population growth. This is for the, the ideal of an unlimited environment. This is an unrealistic situation because there's never an unlimited environment. So in this situation, what happens is that you have a population that's able to reproduce very quickly. And so rabbits have the stereotype of being able to reproduce really quickly, and it is completely true. Uh, they are able to reproduce um, and kind of increase their population at a very fast rate. Now, what's gonna happen is that if there is no limitations on the environment, that means that there's a ton of space there's enough food for, you know, as many organisms as possible, then you would have something like this exponential growth rate, okay? And you would have, you know, constant births and death, but you would have this increasing population, okay? But again, this is not realistic because there's always going to be limitations in space and food and water and things like that. For most populations in most natural environments, there are going to be limited resources. And so a population can only grow so large before it starts to 
kind of overuse those, those um, resources. And so this is called logistic population growth model. This is more realistic. Um, and so there are going to be lots of limiting factors that are going to control population growth. Okay, so even if it's possible for organisms to continue to reproduce and have more babies, at some point there's not going to be enough food and space, and so those babies will die. So you kind of get to this point where you have what we call a carrying capacity. So an environment has a specific carrying capacity that will allow for this many organisms to be there, but once you have more than that, you're going to start having issues. Okay, so again, that carrying capacity is the maximum population size that an environment can sustain. Now, in logistic population growth, um, when the growth rate decreases um, near kind of the time when the population approaches this, this carrying capacity, so you can't continuously have really, really high um, population growth. And so you start off with very kind of rapid population growth in doubling time, but once you get closer to that carrying capacity, you start to kind of get this point where ultimately you're going to get to a growth rate of zero. Okay, so at the actual carrying capacity, you're not really having more born than you are having die. So it's kind of equal. So here we have an example of these um, male fur seals. And they looked at kind of this population uh, that they saw on this island and kind of did the looked at the actual numbers of the individuals and what you can see is that this group um, from the years 1915 to 1945 kind of reached this carrying capacity okay and so they had times between 1915 and 1935 ish that had increasing growth rates but at this point the growth rate is basically at zero so the carrying capacity for populations will depend on the different habitats so certain habitats are going to have um, higher carrying capacities, other ones will have lower carrying capacities, and it all has to do with what are the resources. How much space is there, how much food is there, how much water is there, those things are going to be really important. Okay, And ecologists hypothesize that there is selection for organisms that are able to exhibit this equilibrial life history pattern, Okay, because this is going to allow them to kind of get to carrying capacity and not go over it um, so that they can kind of continue this, um, this population size and not have really bad issues start to happen. So we're now going to start talking about some regulation to population growth. And one type that we see is something called density dependent factors. And density dependent factors mean that they're only going to be kind of really important once a population gets to a certain density. So it's, if it's below that density, you don't really have this density dependent factor. Um, but once it gets to a certain level, then you start to have um, this factor kind of start to affect how the population will grow. Now, the, a good example of this is intraspecific competition. And the word intraspecific I want you to see that it has an A in it, so it's I-N-T-R-A. Intraspecific means that this is going to be competition between members of the same species. Okay, so in this picture, we have two wild dogs kind of going after a, um, a deer, it looks like. And I don't exactly remember what species of wild um, dog this is. But both of these are going after the same food source. And... You know, as much as we like to think that there would be um, kind of sharing, that's just not how it happens in uh, most species. And so if that one dog is not able to get the food that it needs, um, it's going to fight for it um, with against the other dog. So food is going to be one of the biggest um, factors um, that's going to start to be problematic once you get to a high enough population. Okay, and so if there's a limited food supply, that is then going to be divided amongst more and more individuals as your population gets higher. And um, if it gets to the point where there's so much competition, certain individuals will not be able to feed themselves and will ultimately not be able to have enough energy for reproduction. Uh, there are other types of density dependent factors. 
um, that will also kind of decrease um, the population growth uh, and will increase the death rate. So here's another example of space as a limiting resource in population. So these are gannets, which is a type of bird, and they all need to nest on this area. And at some point you're gonna run out of space. So when the population is really low, um, population density is very low, you won't have any issues with space, but once they get to a certain population density, then there starts to be a lot of competition. And so if there's not enough room, there's gonna be competition between the different gannets and some of them are not going to be able to have their nests in the right areas. Now, in, in another type, we have density independent factors. So these are going to be kind of abiotic factors that can limit or reduce population size. Uh, and they don't really matter what your density is. So if you have very small density, it can be impacted by density independent factors or really high density population. So it doesn't really matter. Um, so, for example, we can have uh, kind of a population limiting factor whose intensity is unrelated to the population density. Okay, and so that's again why it's called density independent. So these are going to be seasonal changes in weather, environmental disturbances, floods, fires, storms, anything like this can affect the population size. And again, it can affect them regardless of how dense the population is. Now, over a long period of time, most populations are going to be regulated by both density independent and density dependent factors. Okay, and so you don't really just have one or the other, it's going to be both of them interacting at the same time. So here we have an example of a density independent factor. Uh, last year around this time, or actually, I'm trying to remember when exactly when this happened, but we had those just horrible fires that were all over the United States and we had some really bad ones in California. Um, so these are gonna be density independent factors that are going to affect population size. So you can actually see two of the deer um, in the water. Uh, you're gonna imagine that many of the different uh, deer are not lucky enough to be in that area. Um, so you're gonna have lots of individuals die. You're also gonna have huge areas that are gonna contain the food for different organisms, those are gonna be gone. And so that is going to then affect how large populations can get because um, they're just not gonna have enough resources. Now, one thing that we often see in populations is that you can have these cycles and you see them, uh, usually it has to do with two um, organisms coming together and they have kind of these interesting fluctuations in population that are kind of synced with another organism. And it often has to do with a population um, of prey and predators. So we have some type of predator um, and then we have a prey and those two are going to have kind of these population cycles. So when the prey get really high populations, then the predators are going to also going to start having larger populations because there's a lot of food. But once there's a lot of predators, they're going to eat a bunch of the prey and then the prey population is going to decrease. And so then the predator population decreases. And so we have the cycle that happens. So what you can see in certain population cycles is that there are these booms, which are going to be kind of rapid exponential growth. And then they often are going to be followed by busts, which means that basically the population has overwhelmed the environment and they're not going to be able to survive at that population density. And so ultimately um, the population will um, fall dramatically. So lemmings are a rodent that live on the tundra and we have a picture of the um, lemming in this bottom left corner. And they have kind of this interesting boom and bust cycle that occurs every three or four years. Um, and they'll kind of cycle through this um, in their population density. So what we have here is a snowy owl, um, two snowy owl chicks, and if you can notice, the nest is surrounded by dead lemmings. And so the lemming population, when it is really high, um, you can have nests that are going to be surrounded by 20 lemmings. Um, and so what's happening are the parents of the owls are going out there and uh, grabbing, you know, hunting as many lemmings as possible, bringing them to their chicks. 
And so you can see that, you know, if there's over hunting, this can then drive down the population of the, the lemmings. And then you can see that potentially the next year, the owls will not do as well because they won't have as many lemmings for their, their chicks. Now there's this really famous population cycle between the snowshoe hare and the lynx. And it's been used to illustrate these interconnections with biological systems for a really long time. And so what you see is that the populations of the hare and the lynx will have kind of these rapid increases followed by rapid decrease, decreases that happen about every 10 years. And uh, scientists have looked into why this is happening. So they're trying to kind of first look at the hair cycle. So there are three different hypotheses to why the hairs are going through these different cycles. And um, the first is that cycles may be caused by winter food shortages that result from overgrazing. So if there are too many hairs and they're eating too much, that can then cause the population to fall. Uh, the cycles may also be due to the predator-prey interaction. So if the population of hare is really high, that's going to be good for the lynx. The lynx will then have lots of babies because they're eating really well, but then there'll be too many lynx, they'll eat too many hare, and the hare population will start to fall. The third is that the cycles may be affected by a combination of both of these things, and that is the hypothesis, hypothesis that's generally supported. So not only is there this predator-prey interaction, but there also is going to be this winter food shortage that's going to cause these hair cycles. So here is what the cycle looks like. And again, this is something that people have tracked for a long time because it's on a, a around a 10 year cycle. Um, and so you can see the population of the lynx and the population of the show, um, snowshoe hair. And so you can kind of see how when the sh um, snowshoe hair has an increase in population density, you then have an increase of lynx population density that happens kind of after. And so we have kind of these offset pop pop population cycles. So there are a lot of applications for population ecology. Um, humans have basically converted the entire earth and the natural ecosystem to produce goods and services for our own benefit. And so it's important for us to understand population ecology in order to maintain um, those different ecosystems or Unfortunately, in some reason, in some ways, we've destroyed them and then try to um, kind of help them come back and recover. So population ecology is used to increase population of organisms we wish to harvest. So we try to understand what are the conditions under which different organisms will um, kind of be the most plentiful for us, but also be able to kind of make sure that there's some for the next generation. Um, we can use population ecology to understand how to decrease populations of pests um, and also save populations of organisms that are close to extinction. Okay, so many of the different plan, um, animals on the planet that we are trying to save and make sure that they're here for future generations, um, a lot of them are going to have to look at the population ecology and try to understand how we can kind of help them. So we're now moving on to the next level of ecology, which is gonna be community ecology. So in this image, uh, this was taken with a time-lapse um, picture. So uh, not all of these animals were here at the same exact time, but they were all here at the same place at some time in um, one day. And so what we can see here is that this is no longer just a population. Uh, we have multiple different species of animals now, and we're going to start talking about how they interact with one another. So in the community ecology, an organism's biotic environment will include other individuals from its own population and populations of other species. Okay, so they're all living in the same area. So here we have um, a predator plus three. All right, I have seen some, some videos of giraffes being taken down by lions, but um, at least two major prey items, which are going to be the kind of gazelle, antelope type um, animal, and then we have some wildebeest. Uh, so all of these are going to be interacting with each other, but you're also going to have, you know, within your own population interactions. Now, when we have all the species living close to 
it's close enough together that there's going to have some type of interaction, this is when we would call them a community. So when we have interactions, we can call them interspecific interactions. And I want you to notice that this word has an E in it, inter, I-N-T-E-R. And anything that is interspecific means that you are having uh, interaction with another species. Okay, intraspecific would be within the same species. Interspecific is going to be between two different species. When we have interspecific interactions, they can fall into different categories based on the net effect on the individuals. So there are going to be times where we would call it either a lose-lose situation or you could say a negative-negative interaction. This is when both of the, the organisms interact with each other and it's negative for both of them. So this is going to normally be some type of competition. So it's not good for either of the species. A win-win situation or positive-positive interaction would be something that's mutually beneficial to both of the organisms. So flowers and pollinators are mutually benefited by the interaction. The flowers get to have um, pollination take place and the pollinators are going to get some type of food from the flower. There are going to be positive-negative interactions and these can take a couple different um, kind of modes. Most of them are going to be something like a predator-prey interaction, um, but it also can be a parasite. So this is when you have a kind of a win-lose situation where one group is going to be benefited, but the other group is going to be harmed and usually is going to exploit um, another species for food. This is something like I talked about predator-prey, but we can also have this happen with um, animals eating plants or insects, you know, uh, those will be um, similar types of kind of win-lose interactions. And there are some interactions which are kind of a win-neutral situation where we have kind of one species is getting benefited from this interaction, but the other species, it just doesn't really affect them. And so we don't really say that it's a positive or a negative, and we just put kind of a neutral. So when we have this lose-lose situation, this is called competition. So this is when the population growth of one species is going to be limited by the population density of another species. Okay, and so this is really common um, and it leads to kind of a situation where organisms have to kind of divvy up the environment or the habitat so that there's not too much competition. Okay, and we can look at what determines whether populations in a community will compete well, certain species are going to have what we call an ecological niche. And a niche is going to be kind of the total use of the biotic and abiotic resources in a environment. So for example, in this image, we have different types of anole lizards. And the anoles are going to live in different parts of this habitat. So you're going to have some that are going to be ground dwellers. You're going to be other ones that are going to choose like these shorter bushes. Some of them are going to all be on the same tree, but the, where they're found in the tree will be quite different. Okay, they're also going to be in different um, amounts of sunlight. So some of them are going to be in the sunny dry areas. Other are going to be shady moist. Okay, and so each specific group is going to have a kind of its own ecological niche. And you tend to not really see overlap too much of the niches. So you would never find two different species that have exactly identical niches because one of them is always going to outcompete the other. So you tend to find there's overlap, but there's not going to be kind of complete um, identical niches. So here is an example of kind of showing kind of comp competing for habitat. So we have two different types of barnacles. We have this clamanthus and this balan balanus. And the um, if you look at the clamanthus, where when and it's in the presence of this balanus, it's going to tend to be at the high tide level, and balanus is going to be at the low tide level. However, if you remove the balanus, you're going to see that clamanthus clamanthus will want to it basically would like to be in the entire range of high tide to low tide. So without having a competition, it would be able to take up that entire area um, and expand its range. 
However, if there is another species and there's competition, it is going to be limited to where it actually can be found. And so Balanus is going to kind of outcompete for that low tide level and the Clematis is going to be kind of ex um, excluded from um, growing there. Now our next type of interaction is a win-win interaction um, and we call this mutualism. So mutualism is going to be when both of the species are going to benefit from the interaction. Okay, And uh, we're gonna have this, we sometimes will call it symbiotic species. So a symbiosis is when you have two species that have a very close physical association with each other. And so sometimes these are actually like one organism will live inside of the other. So we have a couple different symbiotic relationships that we've talked about that are considered mutualisms. For example, we talked about the root fungus association with mycorrhizae. Um, in this situation, fungus will deliver the nutrients to the, the roots of the plant and the plant will then give kind of glucose to the mycorrhizae or the fungus part. In coral reefs, they have this mutualistic relationship. So there are going to be coral animals um, and millions of unicellular algae that will then live in the, the coral. Okay, and so we have this close interaction between the two. They usually depend on each other and can't live without the other. So um, it is going to be kind of this mutualism that allows them to both benefit. Our next interaction is going to be a win-lose situation, and this is going to be predation. So when we have an interaction in which one species like the predator will then kill and eat another species, the prey, we're going to have a positive relationship for the predator and a negative for the prey. Uh, there are lots of different adaptations that uh, both the predator and the prey can evolve. And this is kind of sets up what we call an arms race where the predator is always trying to um, be able to catch the prey and the prey is trying to evade the predators and so natural selection will select for different traits that will allow for both of them to kind of um, deal with this interaction. For example, we have um, pronghorn antelope. They will run very fast um, and can escape their predators. Others will kind of hide if they have a predator around. Um, and then some prey will actually grow these things like porcupine quills. Um, and in this situation, what happens is the porcupine will actually back up into the predator and the predator will get porcupine quills all over the face. Um, and so very, uh, you know, kind of not fun to deal with for the predator. So we um, can see that this is a negative interaction, but there are mechanisms for the prey to defend itself. There are other types of ways for prey to avoid um, getting eaten or at least causing more problems for the predator. And so all of these organisms that you see here have some type of adaptation that's going to allow them to kind of either hide or act as a warning sign to the predator. So we can have camouflage or what we call cryptic coloration, which makes um, for example, these two moths look very similar to the environment that they're on, so you, it's hard to see them. So uh, predators will not be able to locate them as easily. There also are going to be warning colorations that can evolve where the color pattern is going to be a warning sign to the predator, either saying, don't eat me because I'm poisonous, or don't eat me because I'm going to spray a horrible smell into your face. Um, sometimes there will be those, those prey items will be actually toxic. Other times they're mimicking um, and kind of almost pretending to be toxic um, because they look very similar to a toxic organism. Uh, but the, the main thing that's happening is that this is another way that you can have kind of defenses against predation. Here's a good example of cryptic coloration. You can see, or maybe you can't, but there is actually a, a seahorse in this image um, that has blended in right with the coral. Here we have an insect that's actually mimicking a snake. The snake is the green um, on the right. And we have an insect that's 
Uh, I'm pretty sure this is actually just a, a, a caterpillar that looks very similar. And so this is kind of mimicking a snake. It's not a snake, but it's going to be able to frighten some predators off. Now, when we have a plant being eaten, we don't call that predation, we call it herbivory. So herbivory is when you're gonna have the consumption of a plant part or algae by an animal. So plants have evolved numerous mechanisms to defend themselves. Uh, many of them have spines, thorns, and toxins. Some of them have very harsh chemicals that most animals don't like. And so for example, things like peppermint, cloves, and cinnamon, all of those are to basically deter animals from eating them. However, they are something that we use for um, food and seasoning. And so it's not really a deterrent to us. Um, so yeah, so I, this is what I said, that they're not toxic to humans and we actually might like them, um, but they are not going to be pleasant tastes for some other animals. So it's gonna protect the plant from being eaten by certain organisms. Now, one thing that we have to start to discuss um, is how these feeding relationships um, kind of look like in a community. And we call this the trophic structure. So trophic means to feed and structure is just kind of showing how the feeding is happening. Now, when we can look at a, a actual community, we can say, well, here are the plants that are present. Here are the herbivores. So these are gonna be organisms that eat plants. We're then gonna see predators. Predators are going to be um, organisms that will eat herbivores. And then we can have even something like a top predator that would eat other predators. And so we'll give examples of what these different things are. Now, what's gonna happen is we always need to start thinking about the energy levels um, that are going to happen. So we've talked about photosynthesis. We know that plants are going to be our producers and they are going to be able to take sun energy and turn it into chemical energy in the form of glucose. Um, and so that initial energy that's kind of stored in the plants uh, will be able to transfer to the other parts of the trophic structure, but they are going to actually lose energy at each step. So you're not going to have as much energy um, at the top predator level that you would have at the plant level. Okay. So this is going to start talking about kind of the transformation of energy and matter as they move from the photosynthetic organisms to the herbivores to then the predators. Okay. When we talk about food transfer we, um, with these trophic structures, we start to talk about something called a food chain. Um, food chain is actually a term that is not used as widely anymore because food um, feeding interactions are quite complicated and they're not just kind of like this eats this and this eats that and that. It's more like this can eat these four different things and then those four things can eat those things. And so we usually use the word um, food web now and I'll talk about food webs. The main thing to know is that at the very bottom of every ecosystem, doesn't matter if you're on uh, kind of land or in the water, you have to have autotrophs. Okay, and those are gonna be plants on land um, usually um, and those are going to be what we call the producers. The levels above that will all be consumers. Okay, so consumers are going to eat producers or eat other consumers. So here is an example of a food chain, and this is very simplified. So again, this is not really how these look, but this gives you kind of a, a, a brief overview. So we have both a terrestrial and aquatic food chain. In the aquatic food chain, at our bottom, we have our producers, which are phytoplankton. So these are going to be organisms that are able to convert sunlight energy into kind of usable chemical energy. Our first primary consumers are going to be zooplankton, and then we're going to have a carnivore. So it's going to be a, one type of fish, and then another carnivore, another type of fish, and then finally we have a top predator like an orca. And so what these carnivore levels are meaning is that they are going to be kind of higher levels of consumers. And so we talk about, um, usually we say primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, and quaternary consumer. Okay, the main thing you need to remember for the primary consumers is primary consumers are the only group that absolutely have to be eating producers. Secondary consumers can eat primary consumers and they can eat producers. So I think he, most humans would consider themselves a, a secondary consumer because we can eat both something like a cow 
which is a primary consumer, but we also eat plants, which are producers. So you can find yourself at different kind of levels of this, but anything that's above a, a secondary consumer is going to be feeding on other consumers for sure. If we look at the terrestrial food chain, we have our plants, so it's a flower, and then we're gonna have our herbivore, which is our grasshopper. We then are gonna have some type of rodent, and then a snake, and the snake can be eaten by a bird of prey. So again, we're gonna have multiple levels. Producers are always at the bottom. Primary consumers always are herbivores. They only eat plants or phytoplankton if we're in the aquatic food system, but they're eating only producers. And then any level above that is going to eat some type of consumer. So herbivores, which eat plants and algae, are going to be kind of our primary consumers. Above the primary consumer, the trophic levels are going to be made up of the carnivores, which can eat the consumers from the lower levels. Okay. Secondary consumers eat primary consumers. Tertiary consumers eat secondary consumers. Quaternary consumers eat tertiary consumers, and so on and so forth. Now, what that that food chain did not show is that there is also going to be another level. Um, which are going to be the decomposers. So decomposers are absolutely essential for every type of trophic structure ecosystem. You cannot have a functioning ecosystem without the decomposers. Decomposers are going to digest all of the dead organic matter and turn it into organic forms that can then be reincorporated into plants usually. And then from there, the plants can then be eaten and by the primary consumers and so forth. So like I mentioned before, food chains are not realistic. It's very unlikely for an organism to only eat one type of food source. It usually, most organisms are gonna have multiple different types of things that they eat. So food webs are going to be much more realistic in showing how the actual trophic structure is um, in the environment. Okay, and so the feeding relationships in the community are woven into a food web. And so a food web is going to be much more uh, complex, complex, and you're going to see that we don't have kind of these straightforward levels of consumers. So what I want to kind of point out is that we have multiple different plants, and then we have what we call our primary consumers. So some of these are going to be, uh, they basically will only eat plants. They don't eat anything other than plants. However, we start to get a little more complicated when we have something like an omnivore. For example, if you look at our um, situation where we have a, some type of rodent, it looks like a little kangaroo mouse. The kangaroo mouse is going to be both a primary consumer because it's going to eat plants, but it's also going to be a secondary consumer because it will also eat like grasshoppers or um, I think in this case ants. And that's going to make it a little more difficult because you don't have to be at just one level. If you notice our quaternary consumer, which is our um, a hawk up at the very top, it's going to eat consumers from multiple different levels. So it's not only going to be kind of uh, eating just tertiary consumers like the snake, it's also going to eat other rodents that we have there. So here is again another image of what a potential food web would look like. This is a really good one because it actually shows the decomposers. So remember, decomposers are going to be fungi, bacteria. Um, we have some worms that are going to help with that. They are going to be absolutely necessary for all food webs, but they rarely are actually shown on the food web. So uh, if you see a food web and you don't see the decomposers, it's technically not complete. All right, and here is a aquatic. Aquatic trophic or food webs can be quite complicated. Um, there are lots of different food sources and lots of interesting feeding interactions. So we're gonna switch gears right now and we're gonna start to talk about species diversity in communities. So we're gonna talk about different communities and we're gonna say, well, these ones are very species diverse. These ones aren't really diverse. Um, and we'll kind of talk about what are the different categories of you know, diversity. So here we have two different communities and one of the communities we're going to say is more diverse. Okay. When you're looking at species diversity, you're going to look at two different things. 
you first look at species richness. And this is the number of different species in a community. So if we look at this specific woodland A and woodland B, if you look at it, there actually are the same number of species. So we have, it looks like one, two, three, four, four different types of trees. Um, so both of the woodland A and woodland B have four different types of trees. So the same species richness. However, there also is the aspect of relative abundance. And so this is kind of looking at how proportional are the representation of the different species. So woodland A has a lot of one type of tree. So that one is going to actually be less diverse than woodland B because woodland B has a more equal number of each type of species. Okay, and so again, you're looking at two different things. Species richness is equal between the two woodlands, but the relative abundance is very different. And that's why woodland B would be much more diverse than woodland A. Now, when we're talking about species diversity in communities, we often have what we call a keystone species. And this species is often going to have a very large effect on the community. Um, and often, if it's moved or removed, it will really kind of make the community change dramatically. Okay, there were these different experiments that were done in the 60s that showed the importance of these keystone species. And if you're wondering what the word keystone means, a keystone is kind of our architectural term um, for building. When you have an arch, you usually have the stone in the very center top that's going to be called the keystone that kind of keeps everything else together. And so that is kind of what the species is. It's going to be the one that kind of keeps everything else running smoothly. So these experiments were able to show that there is evidence for keystone um, species and that they're very important in kind of maintaining diversity. So the, the first really um, important experiment had to do with sea stars and these intertidal zones in Washington. Okay, And so what happens is they're going to remove the sea stars from certain intertidal zones and they're going to see that when you do that you have big dramatic differences start to happen. So if we have a population with the sea star we have a very diverse in our community. We have a lot of different species and they're kind of evenly um, proportional so that you know there's lots of different groups in there. If you remove a sea star from the population, and they did this, they actually went to different parts of the tide pools, removed the sea stars, probably put them somewhere else. What happened is that the, um, the actual mussels and barnacles were able to outperform the other groups and so you actually lost some of your diversity and so the what's happening here is that the sea star was able to kind of predate and keep some of these other species in check so that they didn't become overwhelming and kill all off all the other groups in there other keystone species have been identified as well for example, uh, the sea otter population off the coast of western Alaska started to decline and they started to notice that the primary prey for the sea otters, which are sea urchins, they started to increase in numbers. When the sea urchins increased, they started to consume more seaweed and kelp and that then resulted in the loss of these kelp forests. The kelp forests are a home to lots of different marine life forms and this just shows that having kind of one species disturbed or declined can affect an entire ecosystem. So it's really important to know that these have kind of impacts on lots of different aspects. So we're now going to change gears and talk about our last level of ecology, ecosystem ecology. So an ecosystem is going to include all of the species that live in an area plus all of the abiotic factors. Okay, so we're going to start talking about energy, soil characteristics, water, uh, chemical cycling, and things like that. Now, a really good kind of analogy for understanding ecosystem ecology is to imagine a terrarium. So a ter terrarium is a closed habitat or kind of enclosure that is going to have kind of water, it's going to have chemical energy, it's gonna, if it's given a light source, it can have light energy, 
Um, and it can have all these different organisms kind of living together. Now what you can then see is how the nutrients in the water are going to be recycled in the actual ecosystem. And you're also going to see what happens when you have light energy come in. So part of it's going to be transmitted into chemical energy, but you're also going to have some heat energy given off. The energy flow is going to be the passage of energy through the components of the ecosystem. So it can kind of be at multiple different areas that you're going to look. We also look at chemical cycling, which is going to be the use and reuse of all the chemical elements. So remember, you cannot create or destroy matter. The matter is there and it's going to then be recycled. So it's going to be in different forms at different times and continuously recycled. Now, all ecosystems are going to require energy and that will allow for growth, maintenance of the body, reproduction, and in lots of organisms, locomotion, so being able to move. The sun is going to be the ultimate source of energy. We talked about this a long time ago when we were talking about photosynthesis. And the Earth is going to receive about 10 to the 19th kilocal of solar energy every day. Okay, and that is equivalent to the amount of 100 million atomic bombs, so an insanely high amount of energy. Most of the energy will be absorbed or scattered or reflected um, by the atmosphere of um, the Earth, okay? But some of it will actually reach the Earth's surface. Of visible light that will reach plants, algae, um, and cyanobacteria, only about 1% of it will actually be converted into chemical energy by photosynthesis. So it's a very small percentage that actually is going to be used um, through this process of photosynthesis. So we can now kind of connect what we learned about food chains or food webs and energy flow through those trophic levels. So what's gonna happen is that at each level of the trophic structure or the food chain, you're going to lose a lot of the energy. So we don't have a very efficient energy transformation we're going to lose a lot of the energy in the form of heat. Okay, um, in many ecosystems, herbivores will only kind of eat only a fraction of the plant material produced, and they can't digest most of it. And so the rest of it's going to be released in the feces. So a lot of the energy just can't be extracted. Um, only a small percentage is actually going to be used for um, growth, and another part is going to be used for cellular respiration. When we look at kind of an idealized energy pyramid, so this is again kind of connecting both our, this is more like a food chain and uh, how the energy is moving through. If we start with a million kilocalories of sunlight, producers are only gonna be able to kind of use about 10,000 kilocalories. And then once we go up to pri um, primary consumer level, we're down to a thousand kilocalories. Okay, and at each step above, you're going to lose heat. So heat is not going to be usable. It's going to, um, we use it in our bodies to maintain our high body temperatures, but it is going to be lost um, and unusable for most situations. Now, the amount of energy that's available for top level consumers is going to be very small compared to lower level consumers. Okay, so every layer you go up, from primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, um, quaternary consumer, you're gonna have smaller and smaller amounts of energy that is going to be able to move through. Okay, and so only a tiny fraction of the energy stored in photosynthesis fall, flows from the food chain to a tertiary consumer. Okay, so if we have kind of a plant, then a grasshopper, then a mouse, then a snake, every single layer we're going to lose some of the, the energy. This explains why top predators are often going to need extremely large territories. So things like lions and hawks and wolves have very large territories because they're going to require a lot of food in order to kind of deal with that loss of um, energy. Okay, so in order for them to maintain both themselves and, you know, if it's a mother with her pups, her pup, she's going to need to have a lot of food available to her. So they have very large geographic territories so that they can get enough food.
Okay, this also explains why some food webs are basically limited to uh, just like three to five levels because at some point there's not enough energy to make it to the higher level. Okay, and so you kind of run out of this energy and nothing could survive at that higher level of the trophic level. So here's an example of kind of our food pyramid, food web situation where we have light energy coming into our primary producers. We then have our level of prim uh, primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary and quaternary. At each le um, level, you are going to have kind of the stored biomass that's being able to be passed to the next area. Heat is given off. Um, we also have our decomposers over here that are going to help kind of return all of the organic matter within the bodies of these organisms back to um, kind of the environment. Okay, and so this kind of this would be our ecosystem level ecology. Now, when we started looking at humans and how we fit into all of this, we see that because we are going to be kind of secondary consumers in most cases, um, what happens is that a lot of agriculture is actually not used for human consumption. It's used for um, livestock. And so the kind of 20% is going to be agricultural use for produce that we will eat directly. But the rest of it is going to be land that produces food for livestock. And when you have these large scale agricultural agriculture, it's really bad for the environment and um, does not really have kind of a very good energy um, structure.